In the heart of Los Angeles County is a safe haven from the noise, pollution, and density of the big city, Angeles National Forest. Offering over a thousand square miles of rolling mountainscapes and infinite opportunities to get outdoors and recharge one's soul. It's also home to the county's two largest fires on record, where Angelinos get a third of our drinking water and one of the most visited forests in the United States. Accidents, crime, and death also find their way here. I'm Mark, and I created this docu-series to showcase the ongoing tug of war between civilization and mother nature in Angeles National Forest. It's a love letter to the Angelus, highlighting the topics that make it so special and interesting. This series will highlight the people who enjoy this forest, those who keep it running, history, crime, wildlife, and more. In this episode, we'll talk about fire in the Angelus. Angeles National Forest has hosted Los Angeles County's two largest fires on record. 10 of our worst wildfires have occurred in the last 10 years in California. Just in the last five years, some of the largest fires by acreage, some of the most devastating fires by property damage and the, and the loss or damage to critical infrastructure. And then we saw some devastating fires that took, took life in California. And, and we've seen that year after year, but more intensely, you know, and we're seeing it over a longer period of the, of the year. And we're seeing that intensity level over more of the landscape at the same time. Quite frankly, when we get to that peak fire season, where resources are going from fire to fire to fire uh, across, across months of the year, um, the ability to staff a fire at that level is just not sustainable. We organized around the fire season, and up until recent years, uh, really that, that model isn't working. You know, we have longer fire seasons, uh, longer burn days, uh, and it was kind of a Southern California phenomenon where you have the Santa Ana condition or other things that push that anomaly year into the fall, into, into December, it's becoming a, a more common occurrence, occurrence across more of the country now. And so, you know, now we refer to it as the fire year. The press often comments that the, the fire season now in California is almost year round. And that's, that's getting to be about true. Um, one of the things that seems to be pushing that um, and was kind of uncovered first in a, in a nice study uh, by Leroy Westerling in 2006, uh, he looked at kind of how fast fuels in particular were drying out and how long the forest kind of stayed holding on to the winter moisture that's usually from the snowpack and had found that already in 2006, the, the fire season uh, was about 60 to 70 days longer. And uh, now they've shown that the, the fire season has increased by about 100, 110 days, which you add on to the existing old definition of the fire season, which was also a little over 100 days. And, and I, I think realistically, you could probably say the fire season now is about two thirds of the year in California. With the passage of time, fire season is becoming more intense and longer. In 2020, we saw a demonstration of all of this up close. Engine 34, you're reporting smoke in the West Fork area. There's going to be secondary information from uh, 120 Paul Sam. Uh, he's on the Crest Highway looking down into the West Fork. Affirmative, uh, he's seeing some smoke. Angel Star Mountain, we see smoke in the West Fork. We'll give you this information here. Redder Mountain, Angel, can you determine if it's in the West Fork on the San Gabriel Riverside or closer to the Angel Star side? Red Box. Angel Center Mountain, we can determine that it is in the West Fork, not close to the Red Box area. It appears to be on the slope on the south side of the Angel Coast Highway. Nearby landmark is Bobcat Canyon.
Bobcat Fire burned roughly a sixth of the Angeles over summer and fall 2020. If the burn areas are ever to return to the ways we remember them, it'll be up to 100 years from now, after our generation is long gone. In the case of the Bobcat Fire, the investigation over its ignition is still open, focused on an overhead power line operated by Southern California Edison that may have come in contact with vegetation on the ground. The Bobcat Fire became one of LA County's largest fires on record, second only to the Station Fire of 2009, another Angeles National Forest fire. Unfortunately, these large fires come at large costs. The Loop Fire brought the nation's attention to the Angeles in 1966 after claiming the lives of 12 young firefighters. The Firefighters Memorial in the Cleveland National Forest commemorates fire staff who heard their last alarm. 118 of the placards are filled and 105 are empty. The heartbreaking reality is that the number of filled placards will increase as fires develop each year. In Silmar, El Carrizo Park and this plaque serve as a tribute to the young men who lost their lives and to the survivors who work with current fire staff in the Angeles so they can learn these dangerous lessons by proxy rather than experience. So, how is it that we're stuck with a fire season now being called fire year? There are several factors, and some might surprise you. I think that sometimes with climate change, people see it as the force that's behind all of our uh, wildfire problems. And any type of wildfire in a particular location is usually a combination of the past history of the forest or, or vegetation type it's in, as well as what's going on with the climate and the weather. Certainly in our forests, um, there's both climate change pushing the system, but there's also a fair amount that is due to this suppression of fires, which has really fuel loaded much of the forest system. Um, so there's kind of both of these pressures going on, and I think we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that as you move towards um, some of these uh, uh, grass and chaparral type of systems, you're actually moving much more into a fire system that is less dominated by um, management that's, that's added fuels and more dominated by climate effects. Um, so there are, there are plant systems, vegetation systems, in which climate is by far the biggest driver of what's happening. And there are systems kind of on a continuing other end of the gradient in which uh, past management practices have contributed to much of what the wildfire problem is. You know, the 1910 uh, fires shaped what the Forest Service uh, basically uh, became in terms of wildland fire and its suppression strategy. And we now know a lot of those good efforts and those, those good strategic efforts towards suppression has also led us to a place where we have big challenges of fuel loading and things on the, on the landscape that are now becoming a challenge for us. So between forests and chaparral, you have this kind of gradient of conditions that's, that's different. But certainly um, trying to say that, that climate change is the only driver that's affecting this is not uh, completely consistent with the, uh, the facts that uh, scientists have been focusing on. There's two general trends with climate change that have held forth. Is that one, the overall temperatures are going up. Particularly, we've already seen pretty significant increases in nighttime minimum temperatures. Um, and so there's this kind of a gradual building of stress on the systems because there's more evaporative processes going on, uh, taking the water out of the system. Um, the second part of it is um, that I think surprisingly, a lot of people assume that there, it's going to be drier, but actually it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen with precipitation. And most of the models, although they vary a little bit, predict that some places actually will be wetter, some places will be drier. But the one thing they all agree on is that the system's going to bounce around a lot more. It's going to be much more prone to extremes and variability. And because of that, um, we definitely have uh, in the future, and we've already experienced pretty significant droughts. Uh, drought is not new to uh, dry western states, particularly like California, but we had a drought in 2012 to 16, 
um, in which 150 million trees in the Sierras died. Um, and a lot of the analysis that uh, some of my colleagues have done is suggesting it, it may be the most powerful drought we've had in about a thousand years because the combination of stresses, you have less water uh, with the system being dried out, but then you have this background pushing going on all the time with the higher temperatures. And so the higher temperatures uh, complemented by that, that lack of moisture really stresses a lot of trees. The Douglas fir is actually something, uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal tree. They're very drought resistant, but there's a tipping point where if they don't get that water, they won't make it. So the long droughts that we've had and the severity of the droughts, California probably has always had them, but they're getting hotter now. They're drier now. The trees often don't die directly from the lack of water, the drought, but uh, bark beetles can sense when trees are stressed, and they're actually the coup de grace, the final agent that comes in and will um, kill most of these trees. Climate change, drought, and bark beetles but also land mismanagement decades ago still catching up with us now. Some more recent mistakes as well. There's a, a very popular environmental group that is going around and saying, no, just leave everything alone after a fire, everything will be fine. That may be true in a different climate zone. But a dead tree here can take 100 years to decompose. Now we have huge piles of firewood, way more than we can sell permits for because it's only good commercially for about three years. After that, it's starting to break down on a level where it's not, it's not, it's not construction lumber, you can't make it into paper, but it's still gonna take the other 97 years to go away completely. It's just not good for anything. If you don't go in and address the areas which are close to recreation places, which are close to trails, um, popular trails, not necessarily ones in the back country that don't get a lot of use, um, anywhere where there is human infrastructure, anywhere where you have fire stations, houses, any of those kinds of things, anywhere you have human interaction, you need to manage the land. And there are several examples that I'd like to show you where we didn't do that. We didn't do it through the first fire that came through in the 70s, we didn't do it after the station fire, and sure enough, the Bobcat fire came through 11 years later, way too soon, and took out whole stands of trees because the standing dead trees were still there. I'm sure I'm gonna piss somebody off and I really don't care. The popular environmental group she's talking about was the Sierra Club. Their media team was friendly but not cooperative when asked for information or an interview about this. I hope to someday know more about that whole situation. It would be easy to argue that civilization is responsible for each of the causes covered so far. After all, 90% of wildfires are caused by people, but these causes are local ones. Carelessness, like sparks caused by cars dragging chains or tow hooks, firearm use, and the tossing of cigarette butts, illegal campfires and campfires that aren't fully extinguished, accidents that cause vehicle fires and sloppy brush cleanup on private property that create sparks, people setting off fireworks. Yes, people actually set off fireworks in and around the Angeles. Aging infrastructure, like the power lines that may have started the Bobcat fire. And the occasional arsonist. The station fire is LA County's largest fire on record. It burned roughly a fourth of the Angeles in 2009 and was started from this lush turnout, intentionally. Fire has been a popular topic in the Angeles for a long time, and as a result, many tools have been developed and employed here. Helicopters have become one of the most useful tools in wildland firefighting, which had its humble beginning in the Angeles back in 1947, when it saw the first use of a helicopter fighting an active fire in the United States, on the Bryant Fire. The helicopters employed these days are larger and more powerful, but flying them still requires a lot of skill and experience. You find that you're flying the machine at its highest limits. Uh, helicopters don't like to fly it when it's hot, humid, heavy, or high. And in firefighting, you're you're flying at those limits all the time. It was like being in combat, where you'd be supporting ground troops, uh, you know, with fire support, and all of a sudden it became night, we can't see, and we have to leave those guys for the whole night uh, fighting the enemy, and in this case, the enemy was fire. And you could hear it in their voices when they say, okay, okay, well, we'll, we'll see you in the morning, and it, it, it was heart-wrenching. 
this sky crane loads up on water from a tank referred to as a pumpkin in Mountain High Resort's parking lot in Wrightwood. The helicopter sucks all the water into its tank called dipping, then it drops it on or near the fire and repeats this process over and over again, the ground crew refilling it after each dip. Fixed-wing aircraft play an equally important role in aerial firefighting, and one unique tool brought into the Angelus is the MAF system. MAF stands for Modular Airborne Firefighting Systems, and it allows military aircraft from the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve to be temporarily converted into firefighting aircraft so they can lend a hand when called upon by the Forest Service. On the ground, Angelus has standard Forest Service vehicles, but also some special rigs. This is the Forest Supervisor's Office in Arcadia, a beautiful, unique building, and home to an interesting selection of the fire vehicles serving the forest. If you've spent time in the Angelus, you know cell reception is nearly impossible to come by. Even the Forest Service's radio system can't reach every crevice of the forest, so satellite internet is provided by a special unit, the only of its kind in any of our national forests. This, along with Chief Garcia's special SUV and traditional tools like two-way radios, allow him and his team to establish a powerful mobile command center where they can orchestrate modern firefighting operations and intelligence from the field. Angeles is part of a mutual aid system where it shares resources with other agencies like the LA County and City Fire Departments, Sheriff's Department, and California Highway Patrol. The Bobcat Fire was an example of a large incident that demanded a large incident command post. When that's needed, it comes together at the Santa Fe Dam Recreation Area in Irwindale. Here, several county and state agencies are present, plus resources on loan from other counties and states. Another interesting tool in the Angeles Toolbox is the use of conservation camps, where minimum security prisoners assist with wildland maintenance, training, and fighting wildfires when they erupt while serving time. For every day served, they earn credits as if three days have been served. There are five of these camps in the Angeles, and even though the program has been around since 1915, conservation camp members saw a big win as recently as September 2020, when Governor Gavin Newsom signed Assembly Bill 2147. As a result, they can now pursue careers in firefighting after serving their time. As research and science have advanced firefighting and prevention, a practice once familiar to indigenous people thousands of years ago is now standard in the Angeles Firefighting Toolbox. Prescribed fire provides several benefits for communities at risk of wildfire. So we'll go through, through a community and evaluate the area for the need or to utilize prescribed fire to reduce the vegetation loading around the community to help provide protection. It's not going to stop the fire, but it may add valued protection for firefighters and for the community or the infrastructure that's there, whether it's power lines, um, roadways. We use prescribed fire as a tool to help out with uh, wildlife projects. Maybe we're trying to improve the habitat. Maybe we're trying to eradicate a certain species, um, like such as the Arundo in certain riparian areas. We'll also use it to help save some of the species that, that are there. So by utilizing prescribed fire, we're able to reduce the flame intensities and flame lengths during the wildfire. And so in hopes that uh, when a wildfire does start, that the severity won't be as significant as if we did nothing at all. A lot of chaparral communities are accurately called fire climax plant communities because when they start over is with the fire that burns them to the ground. So fire is very much a part of this regime, but if it happens too often, we, within the second fire, we, you start to lose your original plant communities. Looking ahead, what does this next fire season look like in Southern California? Uh, it looks like it's gonna be a tough one. Um, we had a pretty low snowpack, um, which is the main thing that is keeping fuels wet in the forest. Um, and because of that, the fuels are dried out. In fact, um, I've seen some initial estimates now that the conditions we have here in late April are similar to what fuel drying, fuel dryness level you would have in about mid to late June. So um, that lack of winter snowpack and water has really made the fuels dry out much earlier, which means that um, 
Uh, right now, if you get an ignition, there's a decent chance you'll get a fire, but by the time you get even further drying going on, um, you'll have an extended fire season um, in which uh, even the big fuels, like the large size logs, will dry out, making it a very, very tough year for controlling wildfires. Um, unfortunately, 2020 was by far the uh, biggest wildfire season we've had, at least in recorded history in California. Um, and this 2021, who knows what it will be like, but uh, if it is a tough one, it's gonna be uh, back-to-back hard years for um, the fire crews that are engaged in trying to control these things. Some of the U.S. Forest Service activities in our preparation, along with our partners, are to increase staffing levels for this time of year, add additional aircraft to keep up with the demands of what we call surge capacity for the peak fire season. It includes air tankers and, and helicopters. We've uh, uh, taken some uh, opportunity to partner with uh, both uh, military assets through California as the fire service, as well as within our agencies looking at adapting the use of unmanned aerial uh, systems to gather intelligence, uh, to gather uh, mapping capability, and, and we're continuing, continuing to expand out on that. Uh, as we speak, uh, California, the U.S. Forest Service in California is uh, training additional drone operators and acquiring uh, additional uh, drone assets for that purpose. What does fire season look like over the next 10 years? Well, I mean, the projections are that, uh, you know, we may get some wet years, but overall, you can't change the trajectory of where climate's going. And, and uh, even if we have a few wet years, we're likely to have some dry years and some very, very dry years. And of course, the other thing that's going on is the temperatures going up makes it that much more difficult. Um, I used to fight fires when I was in college, and um, one of the things that I found out quickly was you generally weren't working during the daytime because most of the time you made progress, the most progress against a fire at night because the humidity comes up and the temperature goes down and you actually have a chance to be able to work with it and contain it. But one of the things that um, I've heard from many firefighters um, is that that respite, that kind of period when the fire sits down on itself and you actually can make some progress on it, is just not happening as much anymore. All the trends are indicating we're going to have more extreme fire seasons, uh, longer in length, probably more burning, um, and that appears to be the trajectory. Now, at least in the forest systems, we do have the ability to, you know, make a dent in that and try to reduce the fuel loads in the forest. Um, and I think if we can get to a point where we're starting to do large-scale fuels reduction, um, we can start seeing better outcomes from fires. Uh, but at this point, um, you know, the fuels reduction treatments are s fairly small in scale in, you know, at least in, in comparison to the size of the problem. We had 4 million acres burn in 2020 in California, um, and I can't speak for the whole state, but the Sierra Nevadas, which I've studied pretty well, um, we've averaged about 65 to you know, 90,000 acres a year in terms of treatment. Um, and, you know, if you think about the difference between 4 million and that size, you realize that so far we're, we're pretty far behind the curve on that. Unfortunately, the reality of fire year is pretty bleak, but there are some positive aspects we can take comfort in. Following a fire, fire climax and fire adapted areas that haven't burned too badly will explode with new growth. There's a thing called succession. And the first thing that you need is microbes in the soil. So if the soil's been burned to, com to just complete sterilization, that's an area that it's going to take a while for it to be able to recover. And if you have fire frequency that isn't in time with that regeneration, um, it's, it's tragic and devastating and your native plants don't come back and invasive species move in. It wouldn't be tragic if it wouldn't be for invasive species. It would just take longer for the moonscape to recover. Um, so that's just one of the reasons that invasive species are so terrible. But the last thing that you get out of a landscape after fire is trees. Our current society has this, we try to archive things. We don't like change. We don't want to age. We don't want the planet to be different. We don't, we want to try to keep nature in this archival state. And it's usually how we remembered it when we were young. And the fact of the matter is that that is not how nature rolls. Fire is 
a part of a what should be a larger scale picture. It's a it's a it's a death and rebirth cycle that is absolutely critical to landscapes. I would encourage people to think about being supportive of the use of fire in these places where it's fairly safe, it's away from structures. But that kind of support will let managers make these really tough decisions um, to actually let some of these fires burn and to get a little bit more headway in terms of the wildfire problem that we have. <laughs>